And so for Becker, it is hypothesized that, that humans resolve the existential dilemma posed by the awareness of their impending mortality made possible by virtue of the intelligence by which we become aware of ourselves uh, by using the very same intelligence that got us into this mess in the first place in the service of constructing and maintaining uh, what we call culture or what Becker would call culture. And so what Becker suggests it is that culture is a set of humanly created beliefs about the nature of reality that are shared by individuals in a group and that a primary purpose of culture is to reduce the anxiety associated with the uniquely human awareness of death. I'll say that again just to give me something to do because I see some of you writing this down. His definition of culture is a humanly constructed set of beliefs about the nature of reality whose primary function, according to this analysis, is to reduce the anxiety associated with the awareness of death. Let me point out for those of you, any psych major types, uh, well, it doesn't matter. It shouldn't matter what your major is. Uh, this is not to suggest that that's the only thing that culture does. What it is to do, rather, is to claim that any adequate understanding of the basic nature of humankind and of the nature of culture uh, must include this notion that it, in part, is serving a defensive psychological function. All right, now, let's think about how culture does that. Uh, and so now the issue is, how is it that culture reduces anxiety? And, and what I want to offer to you in that regard uh, are three things. I want to talk about the notion that culture lends meaning. Secondly, that it confers value. And thirdly, that it serves to deny death, and hence the title of Becker's book, The Denial of Death. What, what Becker suggests, first of all, is that a primary function of culture is to give us a sense that life is meaningful. What he points out is that there's a ton of different cultures in the world around us, and they all seem to be very different and yet what they share in common, regardless of their superficial differences, is that they all provide answers to universal cosmological questions about the nature of life, and that the answers that are provided are geared ultimately to convince us that we live in a universe that is relatively stable, orderly, and meaningful. All right, now let's just think about that. What do we mean when we talk about cosmological questions? What, what's cosmological? Anybody? GRE word. <laughs> Pardon me? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Cosmological is big, 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 big questions. And, and, and the point is, it has a lot of connotations, but the, the way I want to use it is in the broadest possible sense. How many of you, when you were kids, thought about, did you ever think about where did we come from? You ever have that? No, some of us have. You ever think about what, are you, what you're supposed to do on Earth, what your special function was? You ever think about what's going to happen to you after you're dead? You ever think about those things? According to Becker, as soon as you're conscious, those questions are going to come up, no matter what time and place you happen to live in. Where do I come from? What do I do? What's going to happen to me? And, and what he claims is that it is a fundamental aspect of culture to provide us with answers to those questions. And, and just some obvious examples in, in that regard, uh, the ones that I, I talk about most often, and I'll, I'll talk about them again today because I haven't thought of new ones, are, are first of all creation stories, and second of all calendars, which I could never spell. Is that E? e? OK. An E there? D-A-R? OK, whatever. I just put a lot of vowels there. And whichever one is right was the last one I put there. That's what I used to do in grade school and never got away with it. Uh, but you, you know what I'm talking about there. Let's talk about creation stories first, just very briefly. You all know that every culture offers an account of how the universe came about. In the Judeo-Christian tradition, how did Earth get here? God, how long did it take the man to do it? Now, the big man did it in six days. Seven was a break, right? And, and uh, most of us share that uh, belief, whether or not we seriously subscribe to it. But you also know that not all cultures share that particular vision of how uh, the world came about. 
I, I, we have some excellent books in the Skidmore Library about African creation stories, so I'll give you two of those that I like a lot. Uh, Fulani peoples in Mali believe that the earth was created out of a giant drop of milk so that when God put the first animals here, uh, they would have something to eat until the 7-Elevens and Domino's Pizza <laughs> caught up to us. Uh, the Yoruba tribe in Nigeria believe that there was just water here at first, and then God came down and put a metal plate on the water, then he took a snail shell and turned it upside down and put it on the plate, which is now floating on the water. And in the snail shell, he put dirt. And then he put a rooster on the, up, on the plate next to the upside down snail shell. And as the rooster pecks the dirt out of the shell, that becomes the different continents. Got it? Excellent. OK, now, let's just think for a moment, what do all of those creation stories have in common? God. They have in common one God. And they have in two common that they're all ridiculous nonsense that a non-retarded third grader would recognize as such with regard uh, to uh, them being absolutely veridical accounts of what actually happened. All right, if you want to get feisty with me, uh, I would grant that maybe one of them are right, but does it make sense that they're either all wrong or n minus one of them are, quote, wrong? Right, and my point here, and I'm not trying to be cynical, and neither is Becker, who happened to be a profoundly religious man, and we'll try and come back to religion at the end of all of this, but the point that Becker wants to make is that the function of culture is not to illuminate the truth, but rather instead to obscure the horrifying possibility that we live in a random and indeterminate universe in which the only certainty is the inevitability of our demise. All right, I was going to talk about calendars, but in the interest of time, uh, I'm going to let you think about them in the same way and move on here. Uh, let's just note to begin with that, that what Becker suggests is that for us to feel uh, relatively at ease, that we must perceive that the world around us is meaningful. How many of you have ever had a day where you've wondered about whether or not life is meaningful? Anybody? <laughs> Good. That, may, that makes you most human. And, and when you're thinking life has no meaning, is that typically a cause for celebration? What's the affect that you typically associate with the thought that life is meaningless? <laughs> yeah. What else? Depression. And, and Becker, in his second book, which was about depression, said, hey, that's what depression is. When, when you think life has no meaning, you don't do anything. In Becker's language, action bogs down, and, and you're turned into a breathing pincushion, incapable of engaging in even the most rudimentary of instrumental behaviors. So what he wants us to think about is that on the one hand, in order to function at all, we have to think that life is meaningful. On the other hand, he says that meaning is necessary but not sufficient unless it is also complemented by the belief that we as individuals are valuable members of that meaningful universe. What he wants to claim is that it's not enough to think that life is meaningful unless you also can perceive yourself as a uniquely valuable contributor to this ongoing cosmic drama. All right, now be honest, how many of you when you were kids ever envisioned yourself doing great stuff? You guy types, I, I, can only, I, I speak more in gender uh, biased terms because my big thing was I wanted to catch like 100 yard touchdown passes behind my back to stadiums full of people screaming and, and then I wanted to play guitar like Jimi Hendrix at the same time that I was catching 100 yard passes. Some of you might have thought about being Nobel Prize winning scientists or, or, or prima ballerinas. Or, or statesmen, or persons, or lawyers, and so on and so forth. The point that Becker wants to make is this is not pathological narcissism, except perhaps in my case, this is uh, rather uh, a, a fundamental yearning uh, that represents the basic nature of the human condition. And, and what Becker suggests is that the way that we feel valuable is in the context of how our culture defines what it means to be a person of value. Uh, what he claims is that what culture does is to provide each of us with a set of social roles with associated standards of conduct, the satisfaction of which allows you to perceive yourself as a significant individual. 